It is really great to be here this morning. We've got a, a special lesson today. It was, uh, it's always interesting to get different perspectives and I read the different commentaries and try to look at it. And, and uh, one of the guys you can tell was a more modern uh, theologian or commentary. And he made the comment that this next section of scripture is some of the nastiest in all of scripture. And what's worse is it came out of the mouth of Jesus. Now you want to read it, don't you? <laughs> The woes on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is, uh, we've been talking about Jesus in the temple again. The, the context is the Passover week, very shortly, only days, a couple days before Jesus is arrested and then crucified. He's having it out with the Sanhedrin in the middle of the temple with literally hundreds of thousands of people just coming in and out of Jerusalem. And they're all, this is the best entertainment in town. They're there to watch Jesus take on the Sanhedrin. And they've never seen anything like it. They've never seen any rabbi talk to the Sanhedrin the way Jesus has been doing so. And when we get to this passage, uh, the whole indirect speaking thing goes out the window. Jesus is heading them right between the eyes. No question about it. It would have been considered a little rude or certainly offensive to talk to anyone that way, but to talk to the scribes and Pharisees and the elders of the city this way was just beyond the pale. You just can't even imagine. And so as he gets into this, he keeps laying on the woes. And as I've stated before, woe is one of those that you can't translate it into English. And if, if we actually did try to translate it into English, we probably couldn't put it in our Bibles. It, it's, it's a pretty harsh statement. And uh, it just means really, really bad. Old Testament through the New Testament, if there is a woe, this is not, you know, the bond woe. This mm -hmm. is biblical hellfire, damnation, lake of fire. Uh, it's going to be bad. Really, really bad. Let's open up. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. Sounds rather strange. In the middle of this conversation, I imagine the, the Sanhedrin thinking, Hey, finally, he's coming around. And he keeps going. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. They tie heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries. I always feel like saying, you know, draw Mr. Rogers, can you say phylacteries? <laughs> I didn't think you could. Uh, it, it, this is a little wooden box that had pieces of the law of Moses written on it, and they would literally, you know, ornately put these boxes together and tie them to their robes, so that they literally walked around with the words of the Torah, the Pentateuch, on their clothing. And the more phylacteries you had, the more, you know, obviously biblical you were because you were wearing it. it it's again to be seen by men. Their tassels on their garments are long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted in the marketplace and to have men call them rabbi, teacher. But you are not to be called rabbi. You, are, you have only one master, and you are all brothers. Something important to listen to. A lot of Christians through the history have not. And do not call anyone father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. 
And this is one of those tough issues, because it's Jesus telling us to have no titles at all. And I don't think that's what he's actually saying. He's saying we do not have titles that elevate us or make us superior to others. Obviously, you know, we call our fathers father, and this is telling us not to. It would be dishonoring of our fathers to do so. But what he is saying is this idea of, you know, calling someone father or teacher in a way that it makes them, you know, we're all we're all equal spiritually, but some of us are a little more equal. You know, it, it's this idea of elevating yourself that Jesus is condemning, uh, not necessarily titles. We, we have titles to distinguish ourselves, whether it's a job description or a position in the military or whatever. There are titles out there, and they're not meant to look down on other people. They're just meant to let you know what they do and where they stand in the organization what their authority and responsibilities are. Jesus makes it really clear, this is the main message, is the greatest among you will be your servant. For whoever exalts himself will be humble. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And again, you find the influence of scripture all the way into the English language, into the 15, 1600s. I always love to you know, uh, in French, you know, someone says, you know, you are introduced, you say, enchanted. it's uh, enchanted. But, but the British, if you were introduced to someone, they would say, your servant. That comes right out of scripture. The, 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 there was this influence of, of if I'm going to have a title, I want it to be your servant. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And again, I want to point out, let's say might be says, will be. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. That's how God, the status God is looking for in us. But you have this interesting principle, first position versus personality. You may have run into this. He says the teachers of the law, they sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them. You think, well, maybe that, that, that seems strange, or maybe that just doesn't fit with all the rest of this context. But what Jesus is telling you is they're, they're in a position of authority. And you need to respect that position of authority even if, I can say especially if, their personality doesn't warrant it. That's hard. Have any of you ever had a bad boss before? He's paying you to do what they tell you. And if you want to keep getting paid, you need to do what they tell you. But that doesn't mean their personality motivates you in any way, shape, or form. But you understand the deal. They're, they're exchanging money for your time and obedience. And Jesus says, look, they're... They're in positions of authority. You've got to listen. When they, when they talk about the law of Moses, you've got to listen to them. Just don't do what they do. Sometimes the, position, the personality of the boss doesn't really warrant respect, but the position of the boss still does. He says, he makes it very clear. This is, this is where that practice what you preach. Saying in English, a lot of people know that without even knowing the scriptures, but it comes right out of these scriptures right here. We need to try to practice what we preach. And we've all heard that, we all understand it, it's a solid principle. Here's one problem. If I had to practice everything I preached on, my topics would be extremely limited. Again, I'm human. I don't always live up to the standards that I know the Bible tells us to. I also know the Bible tells us to we can't without the transformation the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And it's something we have to strive for. We're always moving, trying to move to higher ground. But we are all weak self ourselves and we fall short. And that's what the Bible tells us as well. And praise God that we have the Lord and Savior who died for us to cover those sins. Because there's no other way to get there. To try to practice what we preach. 
Now we get into what I call Billy Crystal theology. It fits uh, really well here. Is Jesus says, you know, uh, everything they do is to be seen by man. And for those of you who don't know, Billy Crystal is a comedian, Saturday Night Live, and he always had this bizarre outfit and way put on. And he'd come out saying, Darling, you look marvelous. And I look marvelous too. I don't feel marvelous. But it's more important to look marvelous than to feel marvelous. He's talking about the Pharisees here, the Sadducees. What they do is, is done for men to see. They want to look good. It's more important than actually having good care, having Christ like care. He's telling us that uh, we need to be a little more concerned with what God sees in us rather than with what the world sees in us. Because it's really easy to get caught up. All of our, uh, you, know, you watch advertising, most of us DVR everything so we can skip the ads, but, but if you're still watching ads on television that you can't escape, they're telling you it's more important to look modern than to feel modern or even to be modern. It's all about looking good. Looking younger. I, I, it, this is one of those, uh, the whole thing with youth, I mean, I, I get it. I wish I had the energy. That's one of my ask God questions. You know, I see a two-year-old running around with all this energy that has no idea what to do with it. And I could really use that. <laughs> and I know what to do with it. I just don't have it. And it, you, 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 you yearn for youth. But growing up in Japan, Getting old was a good thing. Getting old was something to be respected. It was, it was just, just being older was a, an accomplishment. And even the language in Japanese, anyone older than you, as a, certainly as a child that I was then, was aunt and uncle. Or if they were much older, they were grandmother and grandfather. And if they got close to someone, you might even call them mom and dad in, in, a, in a familial sort of way. But it was something to be be respected and valued. If you had problems, you went and talked to the to the older people, the elders of the city. And one of the things that if, if you watch Japanese movies, probably don't. Younger people are doing it a lot more these days. But but the fact is that, that you see a Japanese movie and it's always this clash between the young upstarts and the old guys. <coughs> And the young upstarts think they've got it all together and they know what to do and they end up just falling on their face and then they won't be able to come and help them. That's a very common theme in Japanese. And so this idea of, of trying to look younger and be younger and look energetic and, and, and all these ads, you know, if you brush with this toothbrush and you use this aftershave and if you do this, you just, you'll have it made. And the fact is, nothing wrong. I mean, I've known a lot of very good-looking people that were really good-looking until you got to know them. And then they were probably less attractive. And I've known some people that they physically might not be attractive, but they have personalities and character that you just want to be around. It, it's not what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside. That's the message Jesus is laying out here and laying it out against the religious leaders of the people who should be the ones with the best character, but who clearly are not. Jesus makes this point that is repeated several times, for whoever exalts himself is humble, whoever humbles himself is exalted. Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much the son of hell as you are. Yeah, I just don't think he's speaking indirectly. <laughs> it's getting pretty harsh. But then again, Jesus knows this is maybe the last 
done, he gets to speak publicly. And Jesus always said, I don't say anything except what my Father has given me. And this is a message that the leaders of the people of Israel who are supposed to represent God need to hear, whether they like it or not. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing, but if you swear by the gold in the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools. Which is greater? The gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on the altar, he is bound by his oath. Blind men, which is greater the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred. Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. Whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And if he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on the throne. He's been very, very blind. And I'll tell you, this is one of the most the heart. Can you imagine? You're a, you're a Pharisee or say you're, you're one of the representatives of God. God. Children of Abraham. And someone says something like this to you. I don't think they were feeling know, any warm and fuzzies here. And yet, they couldn't attack him there because the crowds loved him. It was very popular with the crowd. They didn't have the integrity to do what they thought they should do for fear of the crowd. Of course, it's all part of God's plan. They turned their relationship into idolatry. They, they, they turned it into uh, paganism, which is, but if you do this, then the gods have to do this. If you say this incantation, if you offer this sacrifice, Whatever you do, when you do that, then, then it obligates the gods to do what you want. In class, we talked about, uh, isn't it great that God answers us according to his will instead of ours? Because we, you know, we, we were talking about it. So it's funny, I was like, God, I need you to help me with this, and here's the way you should do that. I'm trying to advise God on how to handle things. And get past that. We all do. We have to get into the job. I need your help. And you know that, that wraps it up for us. And I trust him to help us. Give us the wisdom we need to do your will, not mine. The Pharisees have turned this into a, a contractual. If I do this, God has to do that. This is what makes me look good. This is what makes me righteous. According to their rules, you had to be incredibly wealthy to be a follower of God. And that was never what God intended. I was checking the boxes instead of having a relationship, which is what God did. He wants to walk with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. He doesn't want us to see him as some divine vending machine. Put in the right money and punch the right button and get what we want. It's not how it works. Oh, swear. This is funny, but this is true in any way. People talk about indirect speaking, but, but every society that's into indirect speaking has these kinds of things. And it's a way where they can talk to each other and without being rude can say something. You know. And we, we have some of those. <coughs> if you invite someone to a party, and you ask them if they're coming, and they say, you know, I'll, I'll try. They're not going to be there. <laughs> but they don't want to say, no, I'm not coming to your party. So, hey, I, you know, I'll see what I can do. First of all, no. And we, we had that too, but the, the, this was a, an elaborate system of swearing. And, you know, if you swore by this, it didn't mean anything. But if you swore by something else, Oh, well, then you were bound by the oath. And, and, and if we had, you had this in Kenya, and this was one of those things where it was, you know, for a foreigner to learn the indirect speaking and to learn when they said, oh, yeah, I'll meet 
sent you there. Well, you had to listen carefully whether that meant they were really going to be there or if they weren't going to be there. And they were telling you that without actually saying. And this is what they, you know, boy, if you swear by the, the temple, you don't have to follow. But if you swear by the gold, well, then you have to. And, you know, Jesus took care of this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. And, you know, you don't need to be a theologian to interpret that. He's speaking very plainly there as well. We have to be known as people of our word, as honest, as trustworthy. That's what God calls us to do. That's godly integrity. <laughs> and not playing these games. Boy, well, you teach them the law of the Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow the cat. People think Jesus doesn't have a sense of humor. They're not reading that carefully. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish. But the inside is full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will be clean. Can you imagine someone handing you this beautiful, shiny, clean dish? And you look inside and it's got dirt and mold and everything. Would you like a cup of coffee? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, we, it's an obvious illustration that Jesus is clearly not talking about spices and cups. He's talking about the hearts of men. But again, when we, we stress the little things that make us look good. I mean, if you were a tither and you tithed your men to the devil and the I mean, that would you must be really righteous to do that. But then they would neglect the more important matters of the law. You know, this is ridiculous. No one would tithe to the, you know, unless they you know, were a factor producing it. You wouldn't do this. Jesus is using it to make a point. If you're skipping the justice, mercy, and faithfulness, the first part is worthless. And it says you shouldn't neglect it. You, you, know, you should tithe. You should sacrifice. You know, the Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. That's not saying don't sacrifice in the Old Testament. It's saying the obedience to God is what makes the sacrifice matter. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness are what makes the tithing matter. Because if you think, and if we start thinking that, you know, as long as I give the Lord 10%, we're good. Only if your life, if you're concerned with justice, mercy, and faithfulness, does the gift mean anything. You clean the outside of the cup of the dish, the inside is full of greed and self indulgence. We're all struggling with this. Because, our, our, again, our culture tells us it's all about looking good. And as Christians, we have to say no. It's all about the integrity, the, the Christ likeness, the God within us, the Holy Spirit transforming us. Uh, the surface level thing. Jesus is telling us what's important to his father. What's the call to action this morning? Well, first one, very obvious. The greatest among us will be our servants. We need to identify as servants before we identify as anything else. We are servants of God, and therefore we are servants of everyone around us. Love God, love your neighbor. Simply let you ask these be people of the country. In a world that is filled with so much lies and so much falsehood, so much disinformation, misinformation, and they're throwing so many words at us you know, on the news that I don't even know what they mean anymore. Racist, and, 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 and we throw all these words around just to put labels on people and again to try to drag them down. We need to be, as Christians, we need to not do that. We need to be careful in what we say, we need to mean what we say, and we need to not demean.
Focus. 